Hello and welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which time zone you're coming from. My name is Camelia Lata, and I'm the Program Director of Alumni Relations and Special Initiatives at the Global Brain Health Institute at UCSF in San Francisco. We're fortunate to also have a sister site in Dublin, Ireland. We ask that you mute yourselves just to avoid any background noise. Welcome to the Global Neurology Forum, Track 2, Exploring Core Challenges in Global Neurology. As we begin, we also pause briefly to recognize the land we are on here locally of the Ramatush Ohlone people. Thank you. This is a public session and we're happy to have you all from national and international locations. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all of the Global Atlantic Fellows for Equity and Brain Health alumni from GBHI who are joining today. Today's forum focuses on neurodegeneration and the environment, toxicants, pollution, and environmental factors implicated in neurodegeneration around the world. This series is organized through a collaboration between GBHI and the UCSF Global Teleneurology Service. As mentioned, the forum today is track two on core challenges in global neurology. There is also a track one on CPCs, which is curated by Dr. Salvatore Spina at UCSF. The presentations are provided for educational purposes only. And I'm very pleased to pass the baton to Dr. Riley Bove, who is one of the curators of this series. Riley is an associate professor of neurology at UCSF. She will be facilitating today's session. Welcome, Riley. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you, Camelia. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. Uh, we have just uh, an absolute wonderful set of speakers um, and discussion. Um, we've done a lot of things to our world and it's high time we think about how uh, these things are impacting uh, not only um, health generally or pulmonary health, but also brain health. And so our, our first speaker today is Dr. Carly Tanner. She's a professor of neurology at UCSF and director of the UCSF Parkinson's Disease Research Education and Clinical Center. Laís Feierstein is Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health in Brazil, from Brazil, um, and part of the GBHI. And she's a researcher at the Laboratory of Environmental Experimental Pathology at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Dr. Mary Berlick Rice is a pulmonologist, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard University at their Center for the Environment. And finally, Dr. Mohamed Salama is Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health um, from Egypt, GBHI Institute. He's an Associate Professor at the Institute of Global Health and Human Ecology at the American University in Cairo. And we're just delighted to have uh, these speakers here with us today. The goals of the conversation today are to talk about um, sort of three distinct uh, pieces, um, to learn more about the impact of toxicants and other environmental factors contributing to neurodegeneration, to learn about the effect of exposure to air pollution on dementia, and then to learn about a longitudinal aging study that explores genetic and environmental factors that contribute to disease in older people. And so um, kicking off today is Dr. Tanner, who will give us an overview of Parkinson's disease, global epidemiology, and the impact of toxicants and other environmental factors in contributing to neurodegeneration. Uh, our three panelists will then share their perspectives from Egypt, Brazil, and advocating in the United States. And then we will have a Q&A where all of our speakers, panelists uh, will participate and be really looking forward to questions and engagement from all of you. Um, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carly Tanner for her talk today. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to present today. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to try to share my screen. And um, I'm unmuted. Is that correct? Good. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so um, I'm I'm going to talk today uh, primarily about Parkinson's, but uh, Parkinson's as an example um, that um, is one of the neurodegenerative disorders that uh, are of importance. These are my disclosures, none of which uh, relate to my talk today. Um, so it was in 1817, uh, at the height of the Industrial Revolution in uh, UK, that uh, a British physician, James Parkinson's, described six people with a motor syndrome, three of them he only saw walking down the street, it was so distinctive, um, who uh, had the syndrome that uh, later um, we still to this day use his name. And so this was a, a gait and balance, a propulsive gait syndrome uh, with stiffness and slowness. Um, we now know that Parkinson's disease, in fact, is, is a very um, wide ranging disorder. It affects many areas of the nervous system and causes many different symptoms, including sleep disorder, sensory problems, autonomic dysfunction, uh, cognitive changes, uh, depression and anxiety. Um, and that it can be quite heterogeneous in terms of how it affects people. Uh, but uh, remarkable that uh, Parkinson's uh, was able to describe this so distinctly as far as the motor features so long ago. Because Parkinson's is a late life disorder, we expect that the global burden of this disease to increase as life expectancy is increasing worldwide. And so this graph just starts at 1950 and ends in 2100. And the dark blue is the world. And then the little lines are different continents. And basically everything's going up. Um, so just on the basis of aging of the global population alone, the burden of Parkinson's is expected to increase. And this uh, is just some data that shows that in fact that that hypothesis is being borne out in fact. So between 2000 and 2019, the global change uh, in deaths due to Parkinson's has been increased 100% and disability adjusted life years by 81%. And the, the bar charts down below show that this is impacting particularly uh, countries that are in the middle, low middle, or low um, socio-demographic index. So the red bar here is deaths globally, prevalence globally, dailies globally as you go across. And the yellow, blue, and green are middle, low, low middle, and low SDI um, countries. So while everything's increasing, it's most remarkably increasing in um, parts of the world uh, that may be subject to um, more problems in the environment. And this is looking at um, a projection that we did on the economic burden of Parkinson's, factoring in both um, direct costs of healthcare, but also indirect costs. So loss of productivity, absenteeism from work, care partner problem, you know, care partner productivity loss, et cetera, and projecting that over time. So this is 2037 at the very end and 2017 at the beginning. And as you can see in the US, that's um, quite a dramatic increase to at least almost 80 billion uh, by 2037, and that may be a low estimate. Given all of this, um, the World Health Organization has recognized the priority to address global disparities in Parkinson's disease and just recently published uh, six action steps to address uh, to in recognition of this problem. So disease burden, advocacy and awareness, prevention and risk reduction, diagnosis, treatment and care, caregiver support and research, all being highlighted as areas that we can begin to address uh, that are critically important. And today, of course, our discussion will focus primarily on prevention and risk reduction, although in fact, you can't really separate these, these uh, all interface with each other. So from a public health perspective, um, prevention really affects all, all phases of disease uh, from primary prevention, which would be really the, the holy grail, which is to actually prevent the pathogenesis of disease and preserve health, 
through secondary prevention, where we're preventing the onset of uh, various symptoms. And as, as many of you know, Parkinson's has a long prodromal phase, which itself can be symptomatic, a phase prior to that, which is probably just biomarkers, and then the actual onset of the, the uh, motor syndrome and the diagnosis of Parkinson's. And even then, we would like to prevent the consequences of progressive disease. So for example, to prevent uh, cognitive decline in people with motor features. To be able to do this, we have to know what causes Parkinson's disease. And this is something that I've spent a lot of time trying to understand with my colleagues uh, over the last several decades. And I'll use as an example the work that our team has done, although others have um, had similar findings. So uh, back in uh, the uh, 1980s and early 90s, um, we were very interested in understanding uh, whether Parkinson's is genetic or due to environmental causes. And this is back before we could really, you know, easily do analyses with DNA. And so as a result, um, we used a very classical approach, which was a twin study. We identified a population of uh, veteran twins who had been assembled really to, to study heart disease and um, reached out to this list of, you know, um, 20, 30,000 twin pairs and um, talked to them first on the phone and then went into their homes and examined them, sent neurologists out into the field to see whether or not um, concordance was similar in the monozygotic twins who were be ge genetically almost identical compared to the dizygotic twins who would share on average about half of, half of their um, genetic uh, inherited uh, DNA. And so what we found was that in fact, similar concordance in MZs and DZs. So it didn't appear to be a strongly genetic disorder, apart from people with really young age of onset before the age of 50, which is maybe less than a few percent of people with Parkinson's disease. The majority seem to be um, not due to primarily genetic causes. And then we followed this population up when pretty much all of them uh, were no longer living, so through their lives and found the same thing. Basically, MZ and DZ concordance were similar, suggesting that environment is a really important contributor to the causes of Parkinson's in most cases. We were also able to take advantage of these twin pairs who are sort of the, you know, the closest we can get in humans to the kind of controlled uh, experiments you can do in the laboratory where you use genetically similar and environmentally similar um, experimental situations. And so we were able to do this in the twins who share a lot of genes and environment and look for things that were different uh, to see if this might give us some clues as to what might be the cause of Parkinson's in these, in these twins who were discordant, one twin with Parkinson's, the other without. And we had a few findings. One was that um, occupational use of chlorinated solvents, so trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene was associated with a greater risk of Parkinson's. And the other was traumatic brain injury, which I won't touch on that much today, except to say the traumatic brain injury by itself um, is a, a worldwide problem. And there may be some uh, inequities in terms of both um, uh, the occurrence of it and in its treatment. And also it may uh, have a biologic reason for making people more vulnerable to other environmental exposures by disrupting the blood brain barrier. So trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene are the most common groundwater contaminants in uh, the US. They are persistent. They're also volatile. So for example, they had extensive use. Um, this is a slide that summarizes um, exposure in the groundwater at the US Marine Base Camp Lejeune, where many, many people um, were stationed and exposed to contaminated water between 1953 and 1985, when finally um, they started uh, closing off and making reparations. So many, many people had exposures to the point that the US Department of Veteran Affairs gives people benefits for um, Parkinson's disease if they spent um, time 30 days or more on Marie's base Camp Lejeune. So one example of an environmental contamination and a relationship to Parkinson's disease. Um, this also is used in dry cleaning and it can be volatile. So if you are in a building 
where um, there used to be a dry cleaner and they didn't clean up well, you may be exposed to fumes, even if it's not uh, in the water, that equally um, may put you at risk. And in fact, there are a few clusters that are being investigated now um, where that may be the case. Um, this is just a summary of some of the list of toxicants that um, we have been able to identify as related to Parkinson's. So pesticide exposure, um, and particularly certain pesticides, paraquat, rotenone, uh, 2,4-dioxyphenoxyacetic acid, or dichlorophenoxyacetic acid, excuse me, that um, itself is a component of Agent Orange, which is another um, occupational military associated um, risk factor for Parkinson's disease, certain organochlorine pesticides, polychlorinated biphenols, and these are all persistent environmental pollutants. And then increasingly um, air pollution of various types and uh, different studies uh, in the US and around the world find different components of air pollution to be associated. Um, you'll probably hear more later today that we don't measure things that well. And so I think the global category is really um, what we need to be concerned about and not one particular aspect. So using pesticides as an example, there are more than 50 studies worldwide that have identified an association of pesticide exposure and increased risk for Parkinson's. And this, this meta-analysis shows this is no association and anything to the right is yes, there's an association. And then uh, these risk ratios, as you can see, range from you know a high of uh, seven to low ones that are kind of on zero or right around zero, but on average about a twofold increased risk. Uh, is associated with pesticide exposure. And I think that by itself is remarkable because the majority of people don't know that they've been exposed to pesticides. Moreover, pesticides is a huge category of different chemicals. So to use this very large category with lots of chemical characteristics and say, look at this, uh, that actually is consistently associated disease makes me think that it's a much stronger association because our measurement is so poor to be able to do that. And this slide demonstrates um, in 2019 global data. And importantly, these data were pulled from two different sources that um, I identified on the website. So the green map shows pesticide use per hectare of cropland uh, globally. And as you can see, the darker is more. The maps, the purple and the orange show dailies, disability adjusted life years and deaths caused by Parkinson's disease globally in the same year. And it, it's just striking to me, the similarities in the color intensity between the pesticide exposure and the, the burden of Parkinson's disease internationally. So again, this is you know not proving an association, but I think a really dramatic visual, at least, suggesting there may be a strong relationship. And the, looking at where is this happening, this shows the increase between 1990 and 2019 of pesticide use per hectare of cropland um, by, uh, by area. So the highest increase is in South America, then Asia, then Central America. Um, North America is a little increased, but kind of flat. Um, Oceania and Australia going up a little bit. Europe pretty flat. And in fact, there's been a lot of regulation of pesticide in Europe. And interestingly, in a few countries where Parkinson's has been measured, like the Netherlands, where there's a lot of regulation, it may be actually um, flatline or a little decrease in the burden of Parkinson's there. And then in Africa, not much. So again, identifying areas where some attention perhaps should be paid uh, to what's going on in the environment from Parkinson's risk. So this is just a cartoon to kind of summarize the different factors associated with Parkinson's. I've talked about most of these. I haven't mentioned metals. There is some suggestion that different metal exposure may also increase Parkinson's risk. Um, and of course, the dilemma is that many people are exposed, but only a few people do develop Parkinson's. And we believe that this is because it's not just a single exposure, it's both your genetic predisposition and also what your environmental exposures are. And this is an example 
um, from the agricultural health study, one of the populations my team and I have studied, where you can see that having, um, this is one of the metabolic genes, glutathione S transferase breaks down toxicants that might come into the body. If you have a, a, a dysfunctional variant of this particular GST, you have a little bit of an increased risk of Parkinson's, about 70%. If you've been exposed to paraquat, but you have a normal GST, you have a slightly increased risk, maybe twofold increase. But if you have both the null variant and a paraquat exposure, you have almost uh, an 11 fold increased risk of Parkinson's disease. So, a really dramatic uh, example of gene environment interaction and why there may be different people with greater vulnerabilities to various environmental toxicants. The other thing is that in most of our studies, we measure things individually, but of course, in our lives, we're exposed to many things and it's simultaneous, and we have many different genetic susceptibilities, all of us in our makeup. Um, and so there are complex combinations that are very, very difficult to get at um, in our population studies that really probably represent the reality. So I've used pesticides as an example, but pesticide plus air pollution plus solvent exposure, all of those things probably um, make things even worse for the individual in terms of their Parkinson's risk. On the other hand, I think that long-term, um, this is still a hopeful finding um, because we can change the environment. And I think we'll hear more about that later in, in this session. Um, and also we're increasingly able to target genetic mechanisms. So uh, perhaps the combination of these long-term uh, can be very important in terms of actual prevention of Parkinson's. And I, I'm so delighted at this point in my career to be able to say those words because um, we wouldn't have thought of it when I started many years ago. So just a, an example, proof of principle from the Agricultural Health Study. This is a prospective cohort of farmers and their spouses. They're business people. They have to record what their pesticide use is. So we get a good idea of whether or not um, people really did have exposures. And then they've been followed and we examined them to determine whether they have Parkinson's or not. Um, and as I said, we found overall an increased risk for one of the chem chemicals was paraquat, an herbicide. So um, an odds ratio of about 2.5 in a case control comparison. When we ask farmers whether they use personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, respirators, and if they had a spill, if they washed off immediately, and then put that into the equation, what we found was that if you use PPE, you did not have a statistically significant increase in Parkinson's risk. There's a little bump here, but that really wasn't uh, significant. But if, if you did not use PPE, maybe I said that wrong, if you use PPE, you were protect it. If you did not use PPE, you had about a fourfold increased risk. So clearly a suggestion that if you take it away, the Parkinson's goes away. Um, something else that we find in our population studies is that some things are associated with a lower risk of Parkinson's disease. And some of these may be interventions that we could easily apply that combined with some of the other um, things we've been discussing could make it um, even more likely that we could uh, prevent Parkinson's disease. So for example, uh, physical activity is consistently associated with a lower risk of Parkinson's. Um, diet, uh, a Mediterranean or healthy type diet is associated with lower risk of Parkinson's. And so looking again in the agricultural health study, what we found looking at a healthy, uh, these are farmers in the US, so it isn't quite Mediterranean, but an equivalent healthy diet in these farmers. Um, if farmers had a healthy diet and they had paraquat exposure, they did not have a significantly increased risk, but if they used paraquat and had an unhealthy diet, again, they had more than a fourfold increased risk of Parkinson's, suggesting that there are simple, easily applied modifications to our health and behavior that might be important. And this is a model that we did using a prevalence estimate that, that a group of us had, had developed for Parkinson's because we don't really know the prevalence of Parkinson's in North America. So this is our estimate. And then using those estimates, um, we projected what would happen if people in the US just increased their physical activity. So if there was a 20% increase over time, this is the expected prevalence over time, this is the reduction. If there were an 80% increase, this is the reduction. So again, a significant change 
and Parkinson's um, incidence if we were able to, or this prevalence, if we were able uh, to get more people to follow a healthy lifestyle. So I think this is optimistic. Prevention is possible. The combination of public health, advocacy, environmental cleanup, healthier lifestyle, and then targeted medical interventions that may uh, address various genetic factors that uh, could also be associated with Parkinson's or other treatment interventions, I think mean that we can hope in the future to significantly reduce the burden of Parkinson's in our world. And I just want to thank a million collaborators. I can't really let, name them, but most in particular, the people who were volunteers in our research study, our partners, patients, controls, family, and the friends, all of whom enabled people to participate, and then, of course, the sponsors. So with that, I thank you very much. So Dr. Tanner, thank you so much for your leadership, for your science, for your vision, um, for your innovation. Um, this is just a wonderful talk. Um, I think we will um, now invite the panelists to join us. So our first panelist is Dr. Salama. Riley, I think you're on mute. I've gone back to mute. Okay, um, from the beginning, has that, was I on mute? Uh, just just recently, just a little bit. Okay. Just when you're so Dr. Mohammed. Good. So, Dr. Salama, thank you so much for for joining us and for for uh, for your presence here today. So, we look forward to hearing um, from you and your research now. Thank you so much, Miley, uh, and thanks, uh, Professor Tanner, for the uh, rich uh, lecture. Actually, what I'm presenting is something could be built over what uh, what Professor Tanner were presenting uh, based on our uh, Egyptian experience. So I'm going to share share my screen. Is it clear now? Okay, so in principle, I, I'm going to highlight two uh, interacting or complementary research we have been doing in Egypt now. Uh, and I think they are complementary because they cover uh, different parts, but eventually they will help us to understand the bigger picture. So the first one is the exposome study. The exposome study is uh, funded by the Bartlett Grant Challenge uh, from the American University in Cairo. And in principle, I consider it some sort of change or shift in paradigm because most of the time we were thinking of identifying some environmental agents and try to link them to genetic mutations or risk genes. And we were eventually doing that in the last 10 years. Uh, we identified some pesticides and correlated to some of the risk SNPs in our Egyptian populations. It was successful, but again, it cannot justify for the complexity of Parkinson's disease. Now, we understood that it's much more complicated. So we started th this exposomic study. And in principle, we think that it's bigger than just uh, expo being exposed to single environmental agent. Because as, as we heard a few minutes ago, uh, human beings are being exposed to different type of pollutants. So why not trying to gather all exposures and link them to all internal response? With that in mind, we started this ambitious project uh, starting by Parkinson disease. And as you can see, uh, we are gathering all data related to exposure. And when I'm saying exposure, it's not only related to pollution, but also to other factors. But initially we were looking for air pollution, history of pesticide exposure, heavy metal analysis, and more. Uh, I don't know if it is clear or not, but this is a, a map built using uh, remote sensing data and satellite uh, data gathered from different places in Egypt. And we are trying to correlate this, those data related, for example, to air pollution to each individual recruited to the study. So this is the first part of our collection of our exposome data. But it's not only environmental pollution, but all, all, also we had this understanding that environment is larger than or bigger than, the concept of environment is bigger than uh, pollution. Now we understand that stress could be part of environmental exposure. Social aspects are part of the environmental exposure. So as you can see, we are also identifying density of population. 
educational level and other factors. We are collecting all those external data and trying to uh, include in a big analysis, uh, incorporating also the internal data, internal data in term of metabolomic analysis. So we are trying to perform untargeted metabolomic analysis on our patients and controls and doing a whole exome sequencing for them, uh, trying to identify different internal uh, variants. With that in mind, we feel that we could reach to better understanding maybe of the concept of the complexity of Parkinson's disease. I know it's uh, a little bit tricky and challenging because the more data you gather, the more challenges you face in analysis of data and reaching to a model that can accommodate all data sets. But we are trying. Um, we have no promises. At least currently, we, we were successful in collecting the data from PILO and we're collecting in environmental data, very rich environmental data, and co incorporating into a, a internal data. Hopefully we can reach to the exposome model. However, as I mentioned, we have a, a different or another part of the study, which is trying to evaluate the social aspect and the longitudinal aspect. That's why we were uh, planning to launch our longitudinal study of aging. And uh, with this longitudinal study, uh, we are trying to gather other non-clinical data, including social data, uh, economic data, educational data, everything that might relate, be related to the lives of Egyptians, and incorporate this alongside our questionnaire that was initially uh, uh, designed to gather in, in only pollution, exposure, pesticides, and so on. Uh, with that, we used the uh, survey uh, designed for the European uh, Aging Study, CHAIR, and we conduct, conducted several successful steps in translating the survey, uh, cultural adaptation of the survey, survey, and even validating the survey in uh, a pilot sample of Egyptians about 50 years old. And currently, we are using the same survey in our exposome data. So currently we have an exposome data related to environmental exposure, air pollution, pesticides, heavy metals, and more. And in addition to that, we have rich data collecting everything related to social life since birth until the development of the disease or until reaching the age of 50 and 60. We hope this two, these two day, uh, studies can uh, complement each other. We hope that we can understand better the nature of Parkinson's disease, determinants of Parkinson's disease, uh, which are not only limited to environmental factor in terms of pollution or, gen or biological factors in terms of, uh, of genetics, but also we feel that social determinants can play a role. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Salama. It's just amazing to see the breadth of omics and <clears throat> modalities that you've been able to incorporate. Shift continents, shift areas, and move to Dr. Lais Feierstein, who's going to be speaking to us about her work in Brazil. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you. My work has been always has always been focused on air pollution specifically. So now the approach will be more towards this direction. So I want to start saying that it's been two years that the air pollution was finally added to the list of modifier factors for dementia. And we can see that it's responsible for, uh, it contributes to about 10% of dementia. So it's an area we should be looking at if you want to reduce, promote brain equity. So thinking about this, it's important to know that air pollution is ubiquitous, but an involent just distributed. If you look at this global map from a global perspective, you can see the red spots, they are where there are more air pollution. When we think of particulate pollution, there is a very important indicator of what we breathe. 
independent office, I guess, or the composition. So we see that more polluted areas are down south. And when we look at uh, more specific, uh, a lower level, like we compare cities, we also see that air pollution is not evenly distributed. For example, where I'm from, Sao Paulo, is this measure 35 compared to 8 in San Francisco, and the World Health Organization recommends below 10 for this pollutant. But the good news is that it can be reduced, so how, uh, it's a potential modified risk for damage. I brought this map to say that although it can be reduced, the, the trends of air pollution uh, is increasing in some, in some regions of the world. These ones that you can see that are reddish, the air pollution trends are increasing. And there are, the, there are also coincide with many places where case of dementia we will expect. So it's not easy to reduce air pollution, but it's a way we can think about. And in this line, very recently this year, some works started to show that reduce in air pollution can improve brain health. So they, they could prove it. In this paper I'm showing uh, to the right, it shows that improvement in air quality in North America during uh, a long 10 years resulted in a slowed cognitive decline <clears throat> in, older, in older women in, in a longitudinal study in US. So it's a promising attitude we could go, we could make to promote brain health. So what I want to bring you now is my specific pilot project that is supported by the GBHI and Alzheimer Association pilot project and then in collaboration with other colleagues, not only the lab I work with, but people that understand from genetics and the physics. And it's an autopsy approach, so it's something more specific how we think air pollution might be my why we show all these studies showing association between air pollution and neurodegeneration. Why, how this is happening? So in my project, we use an autopsy approach to investigate neuro, the neuroinflammation profile in the olfactory loop. So this is the part we select in the brain. And we investigate the presence of black carbon in the olfactory loop and its correlation with neuroinflammation. If you just, what, what is different? If you heard the previous colleagues and you're going to air pollution studies, one of the biggest challenge of this area is to quantify exposure to air pollution along life. And most of the studies, all the studies actually that are showing that air pollution are in the brain and can reach neuroinflammation, they are proxies of air pollution. They show like they measure metals in the brain and they measure what is affecting the neuroinflammation. But there is, you cannot make sure, know for sure if these metals are coming for, from air pollution or other exposures like foodborne or occupational. It's not possible till now to know this. So this is why what we are doing is important. The only paper that we know that could see and prove the airborne particle was in a human tissue is this Bove from 2019 that showed that air pollution in the placenta, not in any part of the brain. And in this, in, in our in our lab because we work with autopsy data and we have uh, access to the lungs, we can also measure the exposure in the lungs. That is what I can show you here. Here is the lung of a deceased from our study, and you can see the there is not that great difference between the black spots found in the lung of in the piece of tissue of a lung of a smoker and a non-smoker. And this is due to air pollution. Uh, our group developed this technique to use 
the lung of the disease, disease as a as the metric of how much air pollution the person was exposed during life. So this, this is what we do. So far we have 60 cases in, in this project and we measure the exposure to pollution through this technique that we call anthracosic index. And the next step is to see this black, this black carbon, the particles and not the metals in the olfactory bulb, in the central, uh, in the olfactory bulb. So here at the first figure, you can see the olfactory bulb of mice. First mice we are doing humans, but just to explain where the idea came from. Uh, the one in the left was, in an ambient free from air pollution because of a filter. And the other one was exposed to higher concentrations of air pollution control in a control ambient. And we observed a lot of black spots similar to those we were seeing in the lungs. And we, we were thinking, are these the black carbon that we see in the lungs? Are these black carbons coming from there? So we stain this tissue and here we can see it stained and without any coloration. And we still could see the black, the black spots there suggesting it would be the same. So the next step we took part, uh, some of these particles from the lung that we knew were, came from there. And from the filter, there is the picture above. And we compared their structure and they were the same, suggesting that they were, yes, uh, airborne particles that were being deposited in the olfactory bulb. And in part partnership with the Physics Institute, we could localize the, the particles in the olfactory bulb. There is in the last picture, the red spot is a black carbon particle. What they do is they have a bifocal microscope and they do a lot of different incidence of lights that reflect different types of substances. And they over, they put a layer over these images. And when they coincide, we can finally see the, the black carbon particle in the book. But this is in the bulb of an olfactory, in the olfactory bulb of a mice that was exposed to high concentrations. And the challenge of this work I'm showing was to know if we could see the particles in the human olfactory bulb. There is exposure, to, is exposed to natural concentrations, not these very high concentrations. So I don't know if I'm being clear, but if we are like, exposed to normal concentrations that are not that high, could we still see these particles in the bulb? And yes, we could. It's a new finding. I'm excited because it was something that we could figure it out last month. So here we can show that we can see the particles in the bulb, in the olfactory bulb of a human. And the next step now is to is staying for to, to see if the surrounding of the particle has inflammation markers. So here is just uh, the markers we chose to check. This is a genetic analysis done by the group that was very interesting to, to, to know that higher in this of the anthracosis, they show different gene expression than those to lower index of anthracosis that measure of black carbon or in the lungs. So we could, based on this, say that yes, the exposure to air pollution caused something different in the gene expression of the olfactory bulb. And this analysis that the colleagues did collaborate to select the, the markers that we watch in the brain tissue. So that's what I wanted to bring about my current study. And feel free to 
more questions and everything. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Feierstein, to see to see um, sort of those really um, tangible examples of the impact, not only on the lung, but also on the olfactory bulb, I think is just so powerful for those of us thinking more about epidemiology and sort of clinical presentations and um, that you're really able to hone in on this pathology is just um, really impactful, I think. Um, talking about impact, it's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Mary Rice to, to speak. Um, Dr. Dr. Rice is a pulmonologist. Um, and so um, as we are well aware, um, sort of activism and, and policy are um, really quite more advanced in the area of lung health and sort of general health than they are in the area of brain health. And so Dr. Rice sort of frequently um, go goes and visits the EPA and has lectured um, about climate crisis and sort of healthcare policy extensively. So it's my pleasure to have her talk about some of her experience in this arena now. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. Bove, and thank you all for uh, joining this um, this event today is really a pleasure to speak to all of you. And these are my disclosures. I've received some uh, money from the Conservation Law Foundation, not directly relevant to this talk. Well, let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, as Dr. Bove mentioned, I'm a pulmonologist. I'm at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and I'm mostly an air pollution researcher. I do a variety of different studies looking at the effect of air pollution on respiratory health, and especially in those with chronic lung disease. But from 2012 to 2021, I was able to uh, participate in the Environmental Health Policy Committee of the American Thoracic Society, which is uh, one of the professional societies of the respiratory health community, and ended up chairing that community for some, uh, that committee for several years. And for me, that was really a transformative experience that allowed me to engage on air quality and climate policy issues on the national level. And so I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, air quality uh, and uh, climate issues and my perspective on advocacy and how I think we as a medical community can be effective. So one of the key points I'd like to make um, and that has to do with the fact that when we burn fossil fuels for energy, um, human health is harmed through greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And that has a variety of different health effects um, ranging from temperature related morbidity to food shortages, effects on mental health. But when fossil fuels are burned, air pollutants are emitted at the same time. And even though these pollutants are mostly invisible to the naked eye, they impair the health of the entire population that breathes the air, especially those with chronic diseases, including cerebrovascular disease and other chronic neurologic conditions. And we know a lot about the health effects of air pollution exposure. So how is it that air pollution uh, that enters the body through the respiratory tract can have health effects throughout the body. Well, there's decades of epidemiologic, animal, and in vitro studies that have elucidated how fossil fuel derived particulate matter and also gaseous pollutants like ozone uh, cause oxidative stress and inflammation, not only in the lung, but also systemically leading, explaining the cardiovascular and also neurologic health effects associated with these pollutant pollution exposures. And you've just heard an excellent stop, talk by Dr. Fajr Stajan about um, evidence of direct deposition of, of these pollutants in the olfactory bowl. So this uh, lists the major health conditions for which there's compelling evidence that outdoor air pollution is a risk factor. And as you can see, it includes not only respiratory mortality and morbidity, lung cancer and pneumonia, endocrine disorders. It also includes cardiovascular mortality and events, stroke and neurologic diseases, and also poor fetal growth. And the bolded conditions here are included in the Global Burden of Disease Report um, as um, conditions for which there is absolutely compelling evidence for a causal link 
And uh, the Global Burden of Disease Report ranked air pollution as the fourth leading risk factor for death, surpassed only by hypertension, tobacco use, and poor diet. It's also very well documented that exposure to particulate matter or fine particulate matter, less than two and a half microns in diameter, is associated with death. And this was work that was done by my colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health. And it shows that the positive slope between daily or annual exposure to fine particulate matter um, and mortality among older adults extends all the way down to very low levels, really across the range of exposure. And for that reason, the World Health Organization recently has concluded that there's really no safe threshold for the health effects um, at which there's no health evidence of health effects from exposure to fine particulate matter. And last year, they actually lowered their annual guideline to just five micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5. And as has already been pointed out in some of the other talks today, um, the overall trends are concerning. In fact, in the United States, a number of hazardous particulate matter days have been rising in recent years. And one of the reasons for this is the wildland fire problem. Uh, the incidence of wildland fires has been increasing and that in itself is driven in part by climate change. Now the health benefits of cleaner air far exceed uh, the implementation costs of phasing out fossil fuel use. And really phasing out fossil fuel use pays for itself because of those health benefits. And here's just one example of such a cost benefit analysis taking a global perspective. And it shows that the global mortality benefit just from reducing the co-pollutants uh, that are emitted at the same time as carbon dioxide when we burn fossil, fossil fuels, lower ozone, ground level ozone and particulate matter. The health benefits of reducing of that cleaner air up exceeds the abatement costs of reducing CO2 emissions. And that's just taking into account the health benefits of mortality, reduced mortality and reduced respiratory and cardiovascular events but there are of course many others. So really under all emission scenarios, uh, we are treating the health consequences of fossil fuel burning and climate change. And I think we really need to let our patients know this is happening to them, even though they may be powerless to fix it. So you know, just as we might say that your smoking from many years ago increased your risk of having a stroke, we could also say that air pollution from fossil fuel burning and climate change is making your neurologic disease worse. I really think our patients need to know this. And there's an important role that we as medical professionals can play in advocating for policies that reduce air pollution and reduce CO2 emissions. I really think that um, we, we as a medical community should advocate for rapidly phasing out fossil fuel burning and to really uh, prioritize the dirtiest fuels like coal that, release, that emit the highest levels of air pollutants, particles, black carbon, and gases. And in doing so, immediate health benefits will result. I think we also have to acknowledge that um, communities that depend on fossil fuel burning economically are gonna lose lose out in that transition. And, and I think we need to, um, to support those communities and, and invest in them and acknowledge that there are also health consequences of, of losing your job. And so that's also part of that energy transition. But we as doctors have really an important voice and people, people listen to what we have to say. So just as an example, this uh, picture here on the lower right is, uh, was a state hearing um, in, in Boston about an energy bill for 100% uh, renewable energy. And the room was completely packed and there were so many different perspectives. But when uh, the person that, sitting next to me is uh, Dr. Alex Rabin, who is a pulmonary fellow, when he and I each spoke, the room was silent. And people were really interested and what the doctors had to say about this issue. There's also opportunity for advocacy at our institutions. Um, healthcare is extremely energy intensive. It's responsible for about 10% of US, US greenhouse gas, gas emissions and employs 
more than 10% of the US workforce, many of whom commute. So if you're in a leadership position at your institution, I really encourage you to engage with your hospital about these issues. You know, what are the sources of electricity and heat and transportation at your center? And, and encourage the deployment of technologies that improve energy efficiency and help push for a plan for carbon neutrality. There's also a, medication, um, a medical education piece of this. There's an emerging literature on how we can teach uh, our medical trainees about the health implications of climate change. And I think that this is a field that's still growing, but you know, we can't wait until this literature is mature and we, we need to start talking to our, um, our medical trainees now. There's a lot of research already, outstanding research, and some of it was presented today about the health effects of air pollution exposure. And that work is extremely important. And I, I think we need to continue to do this work. We also need to do research that is policy relevant, that helps us understand um, what are the most effective policies to improve uh, neurologic health and lung health. So just some examples, thinking about the health costs of carbon dioxide emissions and getting that into policies. Um, thinking about trying to determine what kinds of interventions can address issues of environmental justice. And, and research that is clinically relevant. So how do we advise our patients? What strategies actually work to reduce the health effects of air pollution exposure? So I want to end here with an analogy of uh, two different addictions, uh, tobacco use and fossil fuel use. So in both cases, it, there, there's evidence that they cause death and it wasn't initially clear, but now that evidence is clear as accepted by the, the World Health Organization. Both are a cause of lung cancer. Both exposures cause stroke. Both impair fetal growth and a risk factor for a premature birth. And children are especially vulnerable to the health effects of tobacco exposure and fossil fuel use. And some of the, these, health, and these exposures and health effects can have long-term health implications across their lifespan. In both cases, powerful economic interests are at play and have so, so doubt about these health effects. And in the case of tobacco, the medical community ultimately came together with a resounding message that tobacco kills. Um, and in the case of fossil fuel use, I would say that those power, powerful economic interests are still in charge of the messaging. And in both cases, we are constantly making excuses for why we as a society should not quit using fossil fuels. So just as the medical community was instrumental in curbing tobacco use, I think we can also be agents of change to phase out, phase out fossil fuel use. So I look forward to the discussion and thank you, Riley and the Global Neurology Forum for this invitation. Wow, Dr. Rice, um, you know, this this last slide about the analogy um, between smoking and and fossil fuels was just gave me goosebumps. I don't know if it did to anybody else in the audience. Um, such powerful messaging, such sort of, you know, powerful analogies. Um, perhaps um, we'll invite all the attendees to share some questions, but perhaps first to stay with you, Dr. Rice. Um, uh, a few more moments, we often worry, and we've seen this sort of repeatedly in the last few years, that strong data and science don't change minds necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the um, analogy that you just used, I think, is a really clear sort of hook and anchor and way of, of, of working to change those minds. When you are presenting um, at the various places where you advocate and where you present mm -hmm. your data, um, do you have any specific um, sort of sort of rhetoric that you find is particularly impactful in terms of sort of bringing the science and the health you know concerns forward in terms of patient cases or mm -hmm. visual 
you know, Dr. Firestein's visuals were so impactful. What, what in your experience really kind of seems to clinch it when you're, when you're. Uh, thank you for that question. It's funny uh, because I actually had a slide that I removed this morning that showed a big toxic cloud of smoke. And I, I looked at the other speakers and I thought, okay, maybe that's a little bit too high level, but I think that imagery can be really powerful. Um, so I have on a few occasions testified at um, Senate and House hearings around issues of air pollution and health and, and air quality standards and carbon emission standards. And all of those times I, um, I have found that telling a story seems to capture the audience's attention more than all the evidence. And as an investigator, I it's uncomfortable to start with stories. You know, I I it's I feel very comfortable emphasizing the uncertainties of my research. And you know, as a scientist, we we need to do that, and uh, we also need to. Um, I don't think we need to exaggerate anything, but I think it is also appropriate to tell stories that help people understand what you're really talking about. So when you're talking about premature mortality or when you're talking about, in my case, I'll talk about a patient with uncontrolled asthma and how that patient just keeps coming back to me. And then they go back to their home next to the highway and I'm giving them all these medications and they're having trouble um, keeping their job or you know, going to school, I think those stories move people. And um, I think as uh, clinicians and scientists, we need to learn more how to tell stories and, um, and be okay with that, that we can be good scientists and still explain concepts through, through stories. Um, wow, that's so impactful. Um, so let's see, we will um, uh, actually, I think just sticking with this theme a little bit, actually, um, Dr. Avelino Silva, would you like to ask your question directly? If not, I'm happy to read it out for everybody. Um, so I'll read out the, the question. Is there a parallel between vaccine hesitancy and climate change hesitancy? Um, and if so, what might be the best strategies to reach out to those who are more skeptical about these impacts? And maybe Dr. Rice will we'll start with you <laughs> given your experience here. <laughs> I think there are some parallels. That, uh, there are some parallels, right? In, in both cases, there's been a ton of misinformation about health effects, um, and um, and in, in both cases, I think there's an important role for the medical community to be con consistent, and uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I, I really think we as uh, uh, those of us on this call who are our doctors, I, I encourage us to talk to our patients about climate change in part because it's it's validating. It's not to um, have our patient go solve the problem. It's um, it's part of educating society about a health problem that's affecting all of us, right? Um, and uh, we were able to get that messaging across eventually with tobacco. I think. Um, what was the original question about, is it how, how to fix it or? <laughs> <laughs> what are the best strategies to reach out to those who are more skeptical? Oh, I don't know if it's the best one, but I think one of them is to talk for clinicians to briefly, just as we have brief messaging about buckling seatbelts in the primary care doctor's office or um, smoking cessation. I think brief messaging about climate, I asked, and it might, I ask all my patients about their COVID vaccine and I have some hesitant ones and I just reinforce that it's the evidence is um, very much in favor that it's effective. I recommend that you get it. Mm -hmm. we all, we're limited in the time that we have with our patients, but mm -hmm. even that little bit, I think makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if others have. And Dr. Rice, you've worked mm -hmm. uh, 
really effectively and especially here in or in the United States. I'm wondering whether um, uh, Dr. Salama in Egypt or Dr. Firestone in, in um, Brazil, there is the sort of um, what the climate is in terms of receptiveness to science about um, climate change or about the environment and its health impacts, and whether there is sort of um, advocacy or, or, or experience um, there for, on behalf of the medical community. Well, I can start so, because uh, actually we had a very interesting uh, survey among uh, elderly population to see how they are appreciating the ch challenges posed by climate change and uh, how they can see it. Uh, so the results were uh, somehow uh, uh, shocking for us because most of the time they said that they don't care. So they believe that climate change impact will not affect them and they prefer to enjoy their, their remaining days in their life without bothering thinking about the impact of climate change, how this, and rather than think about the carbon footprint and the other issues, they prefer to keep their lifestyle because it's not something that will be reflected on them. Although during discussions we mentioned that, but it could be affected, affecting your kids, your children and so on, so they said, but anyway, uh, I prefer to stay on my lifestyle and complete my life uh, as I started. And the, most of them, they didn't have any plans to convert into more climate preserving uh, uh, approach or whatever. So this was something interesting. But this is the thing. And, uh, really thinking very much in the present. Um, Dr. Firestein, how about you in Brazil? I know where there's a lot of um, sort of ongoing elections and so yeah. forth. So can it's you a very us? interesting question and very hard to answer. I think personally, what drive me into research was the belief that this information was important. And like nine years ago, we wrote this paper commenting, we did a correlation between the amount of science produced on this topic and correlating to, uh, how can I say, air quality standards, guidelines, like a kind of relation to the policy. And we, we tend to think by that time that more science was related to more advocacy and around air quality standards more than I know more about air quality standards than climate change. But what we are seeing now in this political environment is a completely, it's really everyone is like, what is going on in Brazil, who we are electing, what we are valuing, just show that most of people really don't care. A lot has to do with what Dr. Mohammed Salama said, that people don't see their lives being directly impacted by this and they have other concerns. I think a lot came from, come, but this is a personal belief, from the political narrative, from people that are in charge, how they tell the narratives. I think it really switch how Brazilians as a general thing. So just coming back to the science thing, if you think like in Brazil, most of the science about air pollution was concentrated in Sao Paulo and Sao Paulo pushed uh, the policies to protect the clean air and Brazil is coming like following. So it was, we were watching this, but now it's a completely chaos. I don't know what to comment, I think. Uh, I don't really know. I need to. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. safe. Hopefully, exactly. someone knows there because we really need solutions. I think this, when the narrative comes from the governors, it's very important. It was important, like with the seat belt that someone said. A lot of people didn't want to use it and end up using, and now it's more natural. So I think some things need to come from from the top, I don't know if I'm thinking right. And, but I don't see this happening anytime soon in Brazil, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, we hope that this next election cycle um, isn't too painful for all of you. Um, thank you for that. Do going back to our keynote speaker, Dr. Tanner, um, in your career, um, it was so interesting to hear Dr. Rice say that she actually brings us up directly with her patients um, because, you know, sort of your sort of kind of seeing patients at a different phase uh, of their lives in terms of Parkinson's disease, you know, really affecting older individuals and so forth. Have you um, broached, and two questions for you. One is, have you broached um, sort of your research directly with your patients or research participants? And then the second question is sort of in your engagement, um, sort of really globally, um, do you have any insights on sort of um, you know, neurologists being sort of active or effective voices for um, for policies with respect to either um, air quality or other aspects of environmental quality. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes. Yeah, so for people with Parkinson's, I think you know we have been doing some of this work focused not so much on um, air pollution but on other toxic and exposures for a number of decades now. And so, um, for example, when I work in with people in the U.S. Um, Veterans Hospital, the VA, um, there are certain, uh, certain chemical exposures that actually entitle people to disability benefit that have, have been built from uh, a combination of the work that my colleagues at large, um, you know, have done looking at those relationships and um, uh, rulings based on, you know, National Academy of Sciences, et cetera, to, to determine that these this entitles people to disability. So there's actually, you know, a very active assessment of what people's life experiences may have been. And now that they have disease, do they have some entitlement to at least have more support for care or or or, or other issues? So that's one whole aspect of it. Um, from the perspective of um, neurologists and um, scientists who are involved in this kind of work, um, there is, a, I think, a growing advocacy community. Um, some of the work that I showed that you know, was from the, you know, the interactions with the WHO, for example, have been pushed forward um, by um, a combination of uh, scientists, neurologists, uh, and um, advocacy groups like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, who have been uh, very active in pushing for um, many of the things that are actually on that list of six things we can do. So for example, um, in the US, we don't know how many people have Parkinson's, who they are, or where they are. So pushing for there to be a registry, uh, to have health reporting as we also have for cancer, so that we can start looking at maps and saying, are there clusters of disease or can we see associations between geographic exposures to certain kinds of chemicals and disease risk um, that would, would help us. Um, and we've been successful in that. And in California, we now have um, uh, ongoing legislation, which has started back in 2004, we started doing this, um, to have Parkinson's disease be required uh, to be reported. And a broader law that right now is time limited only for a few years, but hopefully will continue for other neurodegenerative diseases to be reported. So including um, you know, Alzheimer's disease, motor neuron disease, and even uh, MS uh, as part of that, that mandated reporting. Now, whether it's mandated and whether it happens is another thing, but at least in California, increasingly, we've also been working on ways to, to use the electronic health record to allow that to be um, something that's easier. And there's a national um, movement uh, which involves the CDC and involves some other state activists that is also happening. So that's one whole thing, that first pillar of finding out who has it that's going on. Um, there also has been a lot of activism around um, some of the exposures that have traditionally have a little more solid evidence of association with Parkinson's to try to address uh, some of the 
the backward steps, in my opinion, that um, the EPA has taken in terms of um, looking at uh, pesticides and determining whether it would be appropriate for them to be used or not. So for example, certain pesticides associated with Parkinson's risk in some parts of the world are no longer being used. For example, Europe, for example, you know, the Netherlands. Um, whereas in the US, they're being used more or even worse, if they're no longer used as much in the US, then they're used in other countries where there's even less you know, attention or regulation. And those maps that, that I really just put together for this talk, but I mean, are striking to me that show, you know, Parkinson's prevalence and use of toxic and chemicals being almost visually identical. It's ecological, but I think it's, it, it's still very powerful to suggest we need a lot more advocacy, but there is certainly advocacy. It's very difficult and internationally, it's difficult talking with WHO. They want to do stuff, but they have very stringent rules of what what they can do um, a, as well in terms of the kinds of statements they can make. So it's it's a hard work, but we should do it. Amazing. Um, so I'm noting a few questions that are sort of more specific about specific um, uh, exposures and so forth. And so we will definitely get to them, but I want to stay on this policy advocacy conversation a little longer before we get to those questions. So um, Aaron Smith, um, staying with Dr. Tanner, you asked, how do you think environmental changes due to climate change will impact Parkinson's and how we might um, and how might we incorporate these changes into prevention approaches? Yeah, so um, that's an area that's been almost not explored at all in terms of Parkinson's and I think probably other neurodegenerations. But um, listening to Dr. Rice, for example, um, you know, some of the things that we would like to know um, for people with Parkinson's disease have to do with conditions like, and maybe this is happening a little bit um, in Dr. Salama's study in, in Egypt, but you know, environmental conditions like heat or the amount of physical activity uh, that a person has or their nutritional status, or you know, as well as what other exposures they might have, all of those things are, are directly or indirectly going to be related to climate change. You know, the availability of a healthy diet may be, you know, dramatically affected by, you know, the global warming and, you know, lack of lack of availability, the environment, um, the impact of an exposure may be greater um, as the environment changes. And so I think all of those things um, sort of headed in the wrong direction, important for us to be really strong advocates. Uh, to try to to show that they are important as much as we can with data um, to uh, identify the need to make changes. Great. Um, and I think and one other question about sort of health promotion um, with Parkinson's disease, Dr. Tanner, um, Dr. Azat asked, in regards to health promotion of some of the determinants contributing to neurodegenerative disease, such as Parkinson's disease or dementia, do you see a more effective approach in communicating with our modern, slightly skeptical society or public than the typical top-down mass media messaging? So again, sort of some of the, to follow on some of the questions that we were asking Dr. Rice, what are your thoughts, Dr. Tanner? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not completely sure I I understand that, but I, I I mean I think the idea is can we come up with a better way to talk? Yeah, uh, better messaging. Uh, I think that that's very important. I'll, I'll say that one of the one of the other things that's changed in my career that I think is just really um, wonderful uh, is the fact that we scientists are not the only people talking anymore, and we are working together with people, not just people. Um, who have disease, but people who may be at risk for disease. So for example, this afternoon, I'm, I'm facilitating a symposium for some of the med students, and I'm having as a guest a person who has a REM sleep behavior disorder, which puts him at risk for Parkinson's. He's coming in to speak with the med students, and the, the whole focus of the symposium is what we've been talking about, kind of, you know, how, how can we deal with um, prevention? Uh, of Parkinson's, how can how can we do that in in every possible way? And I think the fact that we are involving lay groups 
and people who may be at risk uh, for various reasons, now that we can start to identify that, is, is extremely powerful. And all of our research studies and sort of advocacy efforts are directed that way now. Great. Um, wanted to shift a little bit back to some of the other questions that we've gotten, and they're relating to more specific uh, sort of mediators. Um, and as we think about mediators, I, as I was mentioning to a friend of mine um, that we um, that we were doing this talk, they mentioned that with sort of um, warming of some areas of the planet, there's concern that, for instance, the squirrels have a longer season to you know gather nuts. And so we're facing sort of an obesity epidemic in squirrels, which, you know, sort of kind of cute images aside, just thinking about how these mediators could then, you know, later on affect brain health down the, down the line is just sort of, I think, really interesting to kind of think about as well. Um, so Dr. Ayala, you said, um, great talk, Professor. This was to you, Dr. Tanner, and it was. My question is, did you see any linkage between high concentration of fluoride in the drinking water, well water, and neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's in your study? Fluoride contamination of drinking water is a major problem for individuals living in the Ethiopian Great Rift Valley. Yeah, so I will say the answer, the quick answer is that no, we didn't. But um, I will also say that um, looking, people have hardly looked. I guess that's the bottom line. And um, if you are in an area where there there is a known uh, sort of toxicant contaminant and you have measurements of it, um, it would be really important to try to see how that might correlate um, with disease. So looking at, you know, can you can you overlay where where there are people with Parkinson's or other other neurodegenerations and where are the higher concentrations in the drinking water? Drinking water, at least where I live in the US, is hardly ever measured for quality. If you have Parkinson's and you want to know, does your water have these chlorinated solvents in it, you have to pay to get it analyzed. It's not like the public health officials are looking at anything like that or trying to regulate it. And, you know, the example of the Camp Lejeune Marine Base, it was like decades that soldiers, you know, were drinking and bathing and otherwise exposed to that contaminated water. Thank you for that. Um, and sort of, again, sort of staying on sort of specific um, sort of uh, uh, pollutants or, or, or exposures, um, you know, every so often sort of the media are sort of sort of there's these sort of media events sort of punctuations where we'll see sort of smog clouds over certain big cities. And one such event, um, it was sort of this guy, the day that the, the San Francisco sky turned red. So perhaps people living in other areas of the world saw um, sort of the impact of the forest fires here in California, you know, resulting in a sky that turned so red that sort of, you know, iPhone, you know, AI couldn't, <laughs> couldn't take it and kept switching the color on us. Um, just horrific pictures of sort of air quality and impact. And so Ch Chelsea Chen um, is asking a question, um, and this may be West Coast question, but I think the sort of the principles and analogies sort of would, would, would certainly apply to other regions um, and for other exposures. But do we think that now with these wild Wildfires, um, use of N95 or KN95 masks may actually be considered forms of intervention or prevention when we see sort of these clouds come in and so forth. Maybe Dr. Rice will start with you for this question. Yeah, certainly. Um, I uh, I was on a National Academy of um, Science, Engineering, and Medicine committee on this exact issue, which is um, guidance for respiratory protection uh, for the public. Um, and the example that you shared, Dr. Bove, of the horrible wildland fire smoke is exactly the kind of situation where this comes up. And it, the smoke really does travel. So in uh, July of 2021, the air quality on the east coast of the United States was among the worst in the world. And that was because of a series of wildland fires on the west coast. Um, and in the U.S., about a third of the particulate matter in the atmosphere comes from wildland fires. Uh, and the, as, as many of you know, this problem is increasing, especially in uh, the Western coast of the United States. Um, we've actually 
During the last several decades, air quality has gotten better in most parts of the United States, um, but not in wildland fire prone areas. Since the 1980s, we've actually seen a worsening in PM 2.5, despite all of that regulation and reduction in emissions. So wildland fires are a huge health problem, of course, for patients with lung disease and heart disease, and also those uh, with brain conditions. So what do our, what, how do we advise our patients? So N95s definitely reduce um, exposure to particles. They don't filter gases. So it's not the perfect solution for all pollutant exposures. Um, but for an acute exposure, when the particles are really, really high outside of the range, you know, in the hazardous range of the EPA air quality index, it is reasonable to consider that uh, as a short-term intervention. I mean, many of you have worn them for really long periods of time during the COVID pandemic, and you know they're kind of uncomfortable. So, um, and our patients probably won't tolerate their, tolerate them all day. Um, I think for short-term uh, exposure, that is completely unavoidable. Like you have to go outside and during one of these smoky events. I think that's reasonable. There's a lot of questions about potential health risks for our elderly patients with chronic cardiopulmonary disease. There's a little bit of resistance from the respirator itself. Um, that amount of resistance is pretty small. Um, it's kind of similar to uh, the amount of resistance of having somebody go through a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And that's something we subject patients with chronic cardiopulmonary disease to. Um, so it's probably safe, although there's a need for more research on that too. Um, I just want to make one point in case I don't get a chance to later that I agree so much with Dr. Tanner's point about the power, the need for interventions and, uh, the power of those studies that show whether interventions make a difference. Um, and someone had asked me earlier about what kind of, how can you really advocate and stories are really important, but pre post studies, studies that show that you reduce the toxicant, whether it's the pesticide or other chemical in the water or air pollutant and health gets better, that's really powerful. And, and people can really get their heads around that. Um, so sorry, that was really long answer to that question. This is a great, 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 great point. And so impactful, thank you. Um, I have one final question for <clears throat> Dr. Feierstein and then Dr. Um, Salama. So Dr. Feierstein, sort of sticking again on sort of some specifics, can you um, talk about what the impact of your pathology findings might be clinically? Do we have a sense of what we might be seeing um, based on sort of some of the, the pathology that you're uncovering? Yes, we, as I was telling you, we want to localize the particles and see the response in the inflammatory marks around it. So I think it's a possibility of how diseases starts when you get the particles through the olfactory bulb and you want to spread it to other tissues. And one thing we want to do is to study the olfactory epithelium barrier. So we can know, really know if this is the way it's getting through the brain. So I think it's very impactful on what triggers the disease. Yeah, that's been a, a really intriguing question for a long time. So really looking forward to, to your next steps on this in this arena. Um, one final question for Dr. Salama before we wrap it up. Can you give us some um, sneak previews of all your omics? Sort of what are we, what do you like, what are the omics? What are the types of data that you think are going to be the most sort of impactful and sort of, um, you know, exciting from the work that you're doing to date? You, you, you have so many different ways of looking at your question. Well, I have actually two answers, a political answer and a direct answer. A political that will better understand uh, the nature and pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. This can be generalized in, in, in any study. I guess for, for specifically for our uh, research, we will have a better risk assessment prediction and stratification for Parkinson's disease based on the multi-omics data to approach it in a more personalized way according to the individual pattern of the disease for each individual patient. 
So I guess if, if this is happening, it will be a breakthrough. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I um, want to thank our panelists and our keynote speakers so much for your uh, participation, for the amazing um, talks and inspiring work that you're doing. want to wish everybody, you know, power to you in sort of bringing these stories and bringing these pre-posts and bringing these patho pathological examples and everything else to light so that we can advocate for brain health along with, you know, lung health and other forms of health. Um, so thank you again so much. Thank you, Camelia, for pulling this all together so nicely um, and wishing you all a wonderful Friday. Thanks very much. Thank you.